So uh, thank you again for hosting it, and I, we appreciate uh, General Carvler and General Dickinson for what they brought to the to the day already. And we've, as a as a result of their uh, thoughtful comments, we've started the day off well on this very important topic, uh, talking about both space and integrated air and missile defense, two capability areas that, without doubt, are truly interrelated. They are inherently all domain, and they are very interrelated. And both capabilities, as you've heard throughout the, the opening remarks, have been growing in importance for many years now and will become even more important in the years to come. So we are pleased to, pick off, to kick off the panel presentations for today's discussions. And this particular panel has been assembled to address the topic of space support and global missile defense, widening our vision. AUSA, to its credit, has, has assembled a strong and a balanced panel that will bring their experience, expertise, and unique perspectives to this discussion. So let me introduce that distinguished panel. As General Ham already identified, our panel chair is Dr. Mark Lewis, who is the Director of Defense Research and Engineering for Modernization at the Office of Undersecretary of Defense for R&E. And he's accompanied by the following panel members, Colonel Craig Rosenberry, Roseberry, United States Army Director at Headquarters DA G357, Director of Space, I should have said. I'm Colonel Eric Little, who was identified by General Carbler earlier, United States Army, who's the commander of the 1st Space Brigade and SMDC. Colonel Jeff Adams, United States Army, but here in his joint role as the Deputy Commander of Joint Functional Component Command for Integrated Missile Defense at U.S. STRATCOM. Um, then Colonel Jason E. Josie, who is the Chief of Staff uh, for Assured Position, Navigation, and Timing Cross-Functional Team in Army Futures Command. And then we'll close the panel with Colonel Eric Handy, United States Army Retired, who is a Vice President for Business Development at David Davidson Technologies. Uh, General, excuse me, Dr. Lewis will start us off with opening comments. Following his comments, each panel member will offer short comments, about five minutes or so, uh, and then uh, we expect to leave about 20 to 30 minutes for your insightful questions, and we look forward to those. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our panel chair, Dr. Mark Lewis. Great. Thank you very much. And, and uh, thank you to my fellow panel members, and thanks for the opportunity to, to speak to you today. Um, I'm, as starting out, I'm, I, I think I want to emphasize the importance of investments in space, especially from space technology and missile defense. And I, I think there's no better way I could communicate that than with a, a, a saying that I, I, I take from a, a very close friend of mine, former Air Force historian Dick Callion, who likes to say that all of history is personal. And, 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 and with that in mind, I'll, I'll point out that the number one technology person in the department, my boss, Mike Griffin, is first and foremost the space and missile defense guy. So I think that emphasizes the importance of these two areas within the department. And of course, for those of you who you know Mike, he's, he's the ultimate space systems engineer, spent much of his career uh, with the Missile Defense Agency, was NASA administrator. So that's the person who's setting the course for our technology investments in the department. So I, I think, again, it emphasizes the importance of, of, of these topics. Um, within the office that Mike runs, the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, we're divided into three different areas. Uh, our basic research portfolio, uh, led by Dr. G. Fen Lee. Um, advanced concepts, led by uh, Jim Faist. And I, I lead the third component, which is the modernization portfolio. Um, we have 11 modernization priorities all derived from the National Defense Strategy of 2018. Um, those include space, hypersonics, directed energy, network command and control, uh, uh, quantum sciences, uh, artificial intelligence, cyber, autonomy, um, as well as biotechnology. And each and every one of those modernization priorities, I would argue, has some element of, of space, plays in some way in space. For example, one of our big interests in quantum science is precision navig uh, position navigation and timing. Uh, advanced sensors that we could put uh, on not only ground systems, air systems, uh, uh, ocean-going systems, but also in space, space systems. We have a particularly strong focus right now in several areas. Microelectronics is possibly our number one priority. Hypersonics is also extremely important, and, and frankly, it's, it's my own research background. And of course, space is, is, extremely, is, is, is at the forefront of our priorities as well. 
Uh, right now, I'm, I'm also the, the acting associate director for space, so I'm my own boss or my own subordinate, however okay. you want to view it. How's that working out? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, keep, I want to fire myself on a daily basis. Um, each of, those, each of those areas is led by an assistant director. Uh, we view those assistant directors as operating at the level of a DASD, a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, and they have the goal and the responsibility of setting priorities across the department, linking the department efforts, looking into the agencies, making sure we're, we're all on board uh, following a coherent roadmap for the entire department. Now, in addition to those activities, let me point out other things that we're doing in, in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Um, of course, the Missile Defense Agency is a direct report to our Undersecretary. So uh, John Hill, the head of the Missile Defense Agency, is a direct report to, to Mike Griffin and interacts on a daily basis in setting the course for, for, for that agency. Um, DARPA is also a direct report to, to my boss, Mike Griffin. And DARPA, as I think you know, has a very robust research portfolio in space. Uh, the cutting edge, sometimes the bleeding edge of investments in, in space technology. Um, we also have the Space Development Agency, and, 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 and Mike likes to laugh that we called it the Space Development Agency because we couldn't come up with a more creative name, but essentially they're charged with, with several important elements of what we're trying to accomplish, including the development of the space transport layer that will be for low latency, latency communication, and also leading efforts in detection uh, against hypersonic uh, threats that, that I think you've all, you're all aware of and that, that, that we're very concerned about. We also have the Strategic Capabilities Office, the SCO. Um, SCO is not a, no longer a direct part of our office, but it grew out of our office, and the SCO director, a newly appointed Jay Dreyer, uh, essentially uh, interacts with, with, with our organization on a daily basis, comes to our staff meetings, and, 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 and frankly functions as, a, as an integral component of the, of the r and &E operation. So let me spell out what our goals are. And, and again, I'll, I'll quote from my boss. Always a good thing to quote from your boss, right? But, but I'll, I'll quote from my boss just yesterday he, in speaking downtown. He said, today we have a space architecture that resembles the space architecture that you would construct if you were doing so without any threats. Right? We have built a space architecture that um, is frankly not robust and resilient against attack. And our goal is to change that. Um, furthermore, we're looking at the technologies that will, in, in my own words, assure us total dominance in space. The analogy I like to draw is we want to accomplish in space what we now do in, in air, land, and sea. Um, today, if the United States Army wants someone gone from land, they're gone. If the U.S. Navy wants someone gone from the oceans, they're gone. If the U.S. Air Force wants someone gone from the skies, they're gone. We want to accomplish the same thing in space. That's the technology that we're looking at, those solutions that we're looking, looking at. And we think there are a number of ways to do that, a couple of key areas that we're looking at. Um, one is obviously to build a more ro robust space infrastructure. Right? That means to build systems that are more survivable and that can be more readily replaced. Um, we are very strong proponents of concepts such as proliferated LEO. We think that's a way to ensure that our systems are less vulnerable and also can be replenished more quickly. And that's been a major push within our space development agency. Um, other technologies that we're pursuing, obviously, when we look at the threats that we're facing, uh, hypersonic threats is at the forefront. We think space is a key element in being able to detect the threats that we will be facing. In fact, we, we don't really know of any particularly better solutions to detecting hypersonic systems than to do so from space. There are significant challenges in doing that, by the way. But we, we, we think we have those challenges in hand. And of course, the Missile Defense Agency is working very closely with the Space Development Agency to pursue those capabilities. Um, at the same time, of course, I think an, an, an important element of this is developing our own hypersonic capabilities. And again, yesterday, um, uh, Mike Griffin talked about an acceleration plan that we've now put into place, which will increase our, our, our hypersonic activities, development activities. And, and our goal is very simple. We want hypersonic weapons at scale. We're no longer interested in developing prototy prototypes just for the sake of developing prototypes. We want to develop weapons in sufficient numbers, in significant numbers, that, they're, that those numbers are commensurate with what we project as our future needs. And um, so that's, that's, that's one of our major initiatives. Um, taken as a whole, I think uh, we've developed a very coherent technology plan, a very techni coherent technology roadmap that addresses all the things that space uh, does for us now and will do for us in the future um, with an eye to the, the, the goals that are very pertly, appropriately outlined in the National Defense Strategy. That's our guiding document. And I think you'll see that everything that comes forward in our road mapping exercises is frankly driven 
by the vision that's set forth in the 2018 National Defense Strategy. Um, for those of you who haven't read it, and I suspect very, there are very few people in this room who have not read that document, but if you have not, I would urge you to do so. It's a very compelling description of the threats that we're facing as well as a very coherent uh, um, uh, explanation of how we need to address those. So with that, let me, uh, let me uh, thank you for your time and let me yield to my fellow panel members. Great, thank you. Colonel Roseberry. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, General Ham, General Swan, uh, General Formica, appreciate the opportunity uh, to come here today to talk to AUSA. It's always a great opportunity to have a, a, a moment to talk about Army Space Operations. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be the Director of Army Space up in the Army G357 staff for the last two and a half years. And what an exciting time to be at the staff level during all these fundamental changes in the organizational structure and, quite frankly, the imperative of the department uh, as it looks to towards space operations. General Dickinson highlighted in his comments, you know, the, the major organizational changes between a new space force, a new space command, all recent developments, a new space development agency out, out of uh, the DOD. Um, so what I wanted to do today really is just talk a little bit f about the importance of space from my perspective, some of the things I've seen from the HQDA uh, level in terms of the department's development of strategies and modernization really to go against, uh, you know, this um, uh, awareness of space as a warfighting domain. Um, as like everything, you know, no discussion about space really can start without a firm uh, background on uh, the impacts of the potential threat. Uh, certainly General Dickinson in his comments, General Carbler talked about it and highlighted both uh, Chinese and, and Russian activity in space. Certainly it's a cornerstone of all the discussions in the Pentagon over the last couple of years. Uh, acutely aware of leadership in the department that our potential adversaries view space as an important part of modern warfare and they view counter space activities uh, as a necessity uh, to reduce U.S. and allied warfighting advantages. Um, DIA has recently re re produced a report stating that you know, the long-standing technical, logical, and cost barriers to space are falling, enabling more countries and commercial firms to participate in satellite construction, launch, exploration, and space flight. And even though those are creating new opportunities, uh, more risks have involved as well. And China and Russia in particular are taking steps to challenge the United States in, in space. Uh, so as the department has looked over these activities in the last couple of years um, in concert with the National Defense Strategy and study through the uh, Ballistic Missile Defense Review, and in particular developed a new national strategy for space and a department strategy for space. Uh, the president signed out the national strategy for space in January of 2018. And that strategy affirms that any harmful interference with or attack upon critical components of our space architecture uh, that directly affects the vital interests will be met with deliberate response at a time and place and manner of our choosing. And furthermore, the strategy goes on to de delineate four lines of effort that are imperative for the department to follow in terms of making sure our space systems have an, a mission assurance perspective and that we're building necessary deterrence and warfighting capabilities throughout the department. So a lot of the activity in uh, DOD right now, particularly in the Army, is really looking at an immediate focus on improving the resiliency of our space assets. Um, constantly, we're looking at our architectures, trying to see whether they're robust enough to support the function of joint warfighters while operating in a degraded environment or in the face of hostile activities. As we try and strengthen our deterrence and warfighting options, um, it's imperative that we look across not only the space domain, but in all domains. As I see it, the current uh, resilient architecture is typified uh, in the inter intersection of space with missile defense through the way we bring space data down into the warfighters through our JTAGs, uh, direct data downlinked into the theater regionally to provide early missile warning capabilities that are essential in this fight. To me, systems like these will be instrumental in reducing future sensor-to-shooter times. Um, but there are uh, capabilities that are being driven. Dr. Lewis talked about hypersonics. It's driving a need for new sensors. And we know space will have a critical role in identifying and 
uh, conveying the data necessary to identify that hypersonic threat and transmit the, the data to potential uh, targeters and shooters in the future. Uh, as we look across larger battle spaces, we also understand that the requirement to shoot farther will drive a need for us to see farther and naturally drives us to a space-based layer and system. So how do we bring all these things together? Uh, truly, the Army you know, is fostered and is developing their multi-domain operations concepts, deploying organizations like the multi-domain task force. Uh, we talk about the space component in the I2Q's capability. We see the synergy that space has across all the domains and all the other warfighting functions, and we're organizationally bringing those together. Uh, the intent to pose multiple and compounding dilemmas on the adversary those formations need cap capacity, endurance, and capability to access, employ capabilities across all domains, particularly in, in, the, in the space domain. Um, emerging concepts are also envisioning forces capable of leveraging every available sensor within an area of operations. Uh, JADC2 has that component as well, and part of that is maintaining accurate and reliable location and communications over strategic distances. Having dedicated ISR space sensors, relay satellite communications, ground stations, uh, endpoint uh, teams, like I think you'll hear about uh, from the Army, the Assured PNT, CFT, are exploring the art of the possible of bringing space capabilities closer to the sensor, uh, to the shooters through uh, robust sensor to shooter experiments. Uh, these capabilities, experiments, and uh, developmental concepts will be critical to advance MDO stated goals of providing ready ground forces capable of outmaneuvering adversaries physically and cognitively through the extension of combined arms cross O domains. And I believe space will be a vital enabler and component to the Army's multi-domain operations capability going forward. So like I said earlier, yes, it's an exciting time to be in the space enterprise, uh, seeing these transformational changes that are occurring both in the Army and across the department. Firm believer that in great power competition, space is an essential capability that will be necessary to protect our forces, particularly in the homeland, and fight and win in future, future wars. Um, we're having successes in continuing to integrate space throughout our formations and uh, expanding our modernization capabilities, but yet much more work has to be done, and we're championing it through team members and partners that we have here on the panel. Uh, thank you to AUSA for hosting this session today. I appreciate you fostering the dialogue that brings us together to ensure the space community is working closer with our, our integrated air and missile defense community. And I look forward to the rest of the discussion and uh, audience questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to, to represent Army space and to participate on this distinguished panel. Uh, regarding the integration of space and missile defense, uh, it is truly an exciting time to be involved with both space and with air and missile defense, uh, certainly two mission areas that are seeing tremendous growth and attention. Uh, and although I am an FA-40 space operations officer, uh, I feel like I should have a, a secondary MOS or perhaps a red tint to my, my shoulder boards uh, representing air defense. Uh, between being the commander of JTAGs, uh, overseeing the missile defense batteries, uh, all of my sergeants majors are, are air defense. Uh, all of my bosses are, are air defenders. Uh, I feel like I, I fit right in here, so it's good. Uh, I, tend, I intend to keep my remarks focused on the subject of targeting, uh, targeting and non-lethal effects in support of missile defense and in support of maneuver writ large. I was fortunate to work in the AOC at al Yadid several years ago uh, while serving as a deputy director of Space Forces for just over a year. Uh, during this time, I observed numerous presentations from the AAMDC commander to the CFAC re regarding Patriot weapon systems and the Cal Dow that they were aligned to. More recently, uh, from 2015 to 2018, as the space lead at U.S. Army Pacific Command, uh, I was asked on several occasions to fill in for the Director of Space Forces uh, during uh, major, major exercises. Uh, during that time, I sat in on briefings again uh, from the AAMDC commander to the Air Component Commander, then uh, Brigadier General Ganey, updating the commander on air defense systems as well as ordnance in support of a theater fight. In both of these instances, the senior commanders had to prioritize and make difficult decisions on what to protect and what to leave uncovered because there was simply not enough capability to go around. 
looking at the sheer numbers and the metrics alone, an area air defense commander has to prioritize placement of systems, manage shot doctrine, and assume risk. So this is clearly a challenge. However, with the effective integration of non-lethal fires and effects, space among the other non-lethal capabilities can assist. We will assist by providing effects against adversary TBMs and against adversary cruise missiles left of launch or in early phases of flight prior to the need for an intercept from those air defense uh, artillery systems. Leveraging non-lethal capabilities will serve to balance the equation between our ADA systems and the adversary TBMs that they're up against. In order to do this, we have to be able to move fast. We, the Army, have grown very comfortable with the responsiveness and speed required against a non-near peer. Well, specifically speaking of the fight we've engaged in over the last 19 years. We are very effective at providing non-lethal fires and effects at a very deliberate, controlled, and slow pace. A near-peer threat will require us to be responsive and flexible. Most everyone here recognizes the challenges that we face with regard to moving fast in this environment. The challenges are the authorities process and the C2 structure. This is what hinders our ability to move fast. I think back to my time as a UH-60 platoon leader uh, assigned to the 101st Airborne Division. Brigade air assaults were a sight to behold. During every brigade air assault, the first element lifted in was always, always the artillery. Why? Because fires support maneuver. Fires often precede maneuver. Space and non-lethal effects are no different. We have got to get to the point where we view and integrate non-lethal fires and effects in support of ground maneuver the same way and at the same speed that we integrate artillery and even mortars. In order to do this effectively, the capability and the expertise needs to reside within our formation. Most of you know that at present time, the Army does have limited space capabilities uh, to provide non-lethal effects. Our senior leaders in the Army recognize the growing demand and the absolute necessity to integrate non-lethal fires and effects and are investing in more capability. More capability, though, is only half of the requirement. Already mentioned there is a need for improved command and control and a need for clear and responsive authorities. We cannot wait for a Pearl Harbor or 9-11 moment to start working and exercising the C2 structure and authorities necessary to move fast. We have to train and exercise these capabilities now. Uh, we heard a little bit about multi-domain operations, and sorry for the acronym, but the I2Q's formation. Uh, as well as elements from the 1st Space Brigade, we are actively working and moving in the right direction with regard to these efforts. I'm going to shift gears a little bit now and touch briefly on the, the missile defense batteries uh, that are operating the ANTPY-2 radars. So there is a high interest throughout the space and intel communities right now to leverage these radars to support space surveillance and data collection taskings. I will tell you that the interest is not to conduct the space taskings in lieu of the missile warning mission but rather to conduct these taskings in conjunction with the existing space uh, or missile warning mission. So this is an area that we're already seeing tremendous growth and I expect it to, it to continue. So with that, I am uh, I'm out of my time and I look forward to any questions that you may have towards the end of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Little and Colonel Adams. Uh, good morning, thank you, sir. Uh, General Hamilton, General Swan, Lieutenant General Formica, uh, Jeff Adams, the Deputy Commander at JIFIC IMD. Uh, I've had the honor of working for both Lieutenant General Dickinson and Lieutenant General Carbler. Lieutenant General Carbler didn't mention this is the first time he has spoken before me. And I can tell you I don't like it as much as General Dickinson did. Um, and the only thing worse, General Formica, than the old guy screwing it up is being the deputy for, on the staff still when they talk about things that screwed up. And I can assure you uh, it's not happening. So. Uh, <laughs> Fortunately, General Carver didn't take my name tag off, so I feel comfortable and confident when I speak to you today uh, about these remarks and uh, the Joint Force perspective on space, air, and missile defense. So Lieutenant General, St uh, Lieutenant General Carbler's IMD staff is uh, out at Schriever Air Force Base, uh, co-located with the Missile Defense Agency's Integration and Operations Center, where we support the Commander U.S. STRATCOM's missile defense coordinating uh, responsibilities. Uh, these include the coordinating global missile defense planning. Uh, most of you probably know that through the ACPA process, the adversary-centric planning assessment uh, that we do uh, with the geographic combatant commands to help uh, holistically look at the enemy 
so that then the combatant commands can uh, check their O plans against what uh, the enemy is doing. And as you all know, the enemy is, is moving fast and working hard at trying to get in front of us. We also conduct the missile defense operation support for STRATCOM out there. And we advocate for missile defense capabilities on behalf of the combatant commanders uh, in that role, of course, uh, assessing Admiral Richard in approving the warfighter acceptance capabilities of the equipment that is being sent to the force to make sure it's applicable for the joint fight, uh, which when we talk MDO, the, the multi-domain operations, that is a joint fight uh, that requires all of us uh, integrated. And you saw and heard General Carbler talk about the adversary and integration. And those are two focus points for him. All the conversations need to begin with the adversary and all discussions need to talk about integration because the problem is too complex. Uh, as General Ham mentioned, uh, the Vice Chief of Staff said, we don't fight in domains, we fight the adversary and it'll take all of us complementary working to defeat the adversary and stay in front of him. So from the Joint Force perspective, uh, some of the key topics that Lieutenant General Carberry spoke about uh, are these approaches designed to keep pace with the threat of proliferation and the advancement that we're seeing by our adversaries. And that strategy includes a deeper and broader offensive and defensive integration uh, to allow multi-domain operations and a more comprehensive approach to missile defense. And that gets after uh, what you may hear is pre-launch operations, uh, from the joint perspective, I will normally talk about attack operations, the doctrinal uh, construct that really we're getting at when you hear about left of launch and pre-launch. Uh, the attack operations are something all the services understand and something we need to get after. Uh, Dr. Lewis mentioned a little bit about the uh, electronic warfare, the directed energy, it may also be the long range precision strike, and of course the hypersonics. Uh, additionally, we need better sensor coverage, particularly in a space layer. Uh, and I say space layer, I do not say under layer. Under layer is more of a terrestrial concept. Uh, when you're in the vastness of space, uh, everything is directed and oriented to other things that are in space. So whether it's Leo, Neo, Heo, uh, everything is in regards to another object. So I'm just going to say a space layer is needed for that sensor coverage, critical to the comprehensive missile defense. That increased sensor coverage will aid in missile defense and in situational awareness. It's a priority for the DOD. The sensor layer will be used and enable us to track the complex threats from birth to death by intercept uh, prior and after launch. And it will enhance our passive defense efforts, as General Carbler mentioned earlier in the Iranian situation. Uh, all my maneuver brothers and sisters calling it run for cover. It's actually a doctr doctrinal concept of uh, element of passive de air defense. So lastly, I'd like to talk about increased integration. I'm glad to see some of our allies in the room. Uh, we must share the burden of missile defense, and that integration is not U.S. only. It is with all our allies. Uh, the challenges to fostering the capability development, integrating allies is always significant. Uh, but policy imperatives are there, and I believe we are making advancements. Uh, and if, if they aren't hearing our strategic message, they're certainly hearing the message from our adversaries with their robust testing and the recent missile launches. So I'm out of time. I thank you all very much. I look forward to the dialogue ahead. And I'll pass it on to my uh, Colonel Yusei. General Ham, Lieutenant General Swan, Lieutenant General. For Micah, thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to address this forum today. I'm Colonel Jason Josie, I'm the Chief of Staff of the Assured Position Navigation and Timing Cross-Functional Team, and we are located at Huntsville, Alabama. We reside in an MDA building, and we're sponsored by SMDC, so we got uh, pretty good hooks into this organization here. The purpose of a cross-functional team, uh, as directed by the Chief of Staff of the Army, is really to accelerate the delivery of our critical capabilities to the warfighter that are in accordance with the Chief of Staff of the Army's modernization priority. Our cross-functional team supports three signature efforts, the ap and the Assured Position Navigation and Timing, Tactical Space and Nav War that you can see depicted on our operational view uh, behind us. Uh, we work these three signature efforts across three time horizons of the near, which we define to about 22, the mid 23 to 28, and then far term uh, 29 and beyond. And our role really, as we've uh, 
identified through uh, you know, just the experiences that we've had is to help our Army senior leaders balance what is the requirement based on what is the threat that we have out there and what are our MDO needs, what is the capability that our industry and our partners and our labs can deliver, and then what is then balance that with the cost, how much is that going to cost over time, and that fulcrum that we balance that on is risk, and that helps our senior leaders make those decisions to accelerate those capabilities, where do we swim risk and getting things out now and bringing it back. Um, so I just want to touch briefly on some of the other two, the AP&T and NAVWAR lines of effort, and I'll get into the tactical space. So our AP&T, the Assured Position Navigation Timing uh, Signature Effort, is really about enhancing our GPS capabilities and getting beyond our pace plan that we certainly currently have, which is if the dagger goes out, then we go to a map and compass, right? We want to layer and have a credible pace plan for a primary alternate contingency and emergency AP&T data. We start by... Uh, shrouding our GPS signal, uh, preventing it from being jammed or spoofed. We integrate other signals within there and other non-RF such as IMUs, vision-based navigation, clock holdovers, and more importantly, we add a distributive capability. Um, you know, one of the things, we have over half a million devices that are relying on P&T. We can't have a one-for-one -one replacement, so if we can put one really good thing in there to distribute that out to maybe six others, that we think is a good thing for the Army and helps with that cost on the back end. Uh, with navigation warfare, think of the situational awareness of the electronic battlefield that's going on out there. We want to have an understanding of where the jamming and spoofing may be coming from, characterize that, and then provide our uh, platforms and soldiers an opportunity to uh, do something about it you know, uh, at the platform level and then at the echelon level, execute operations there, counterpunch, if you will, with the electronic attack. And then in tactical space, we're integrating the space-based sensors and capability with our ISR, RISTA, comms, P&T, through a battle management command and control system to support multi-domain uh, operations and sensor-to-shooter uh, ops. So what are we going to do with the sensor-to-shooter efforts? We start with an any sensor best shooter approach to integrate this across um, down to the soldier level, well, really the, uh, the executor level, to enhance his access to the targets uh, via the deep space sensing that was talked about up there to mitigate some of our MDO gaps. And this will enable those precision fires at range, which is the chief of staff of the Army's number one priority. Uh, why do we do this, of course, in uh, near-peer multi-domain operations, large-scale combat operations? We need to reduce that time to target and shorten that kill chain, and then be able to transmit that data in a GPS to challenge environment across our networks. So how are we going to go about doing this? we got a, th a three-layered approach as we go out uh, and looking to solve this problem. Our first is we got to operationalize that center-to-shooter process. We are executing uh, experiments and demos in major theaters, not in simulations, not in labs, with the soldiers to analyze the specific processes that are involved from uh, identification of a target, tracking that through the fire control system, and how does that data pass through and get down to the shooter, and then determine what's the best shooter um, to engage that target with, and then we, uh, we look at the soldier feedback and the commander feedback and integrate that into a package to determine where we should invest our resources to get the most efficiency and effectiveness in that kill chain. The second thing we want to do is utilize the space-based capability to engage and defeat this time-sensitive target. So, so we have to assess what our capabilities we have now that are required against the target sets uh, through the intelligence community, national technical means, and, and commercial, ID those gaps, and really we start with what are our high payoff target lists, balance that on the, uh, the probability and consequences, and then uh, translate that into how do we best fill those gaps with what we have in the near, mid, and far terms. And lastly, we take an agnostic approach to the sensors. We can take terrestrial, aerial, or space-based sensing data put it through a common ground station, because really that's where it's all going to come together, at the tactical edge, division, brigade level, um, and augment that with machine learning and artificial intelligence, right, in order to quicken that pace so that from identification to target transmission through that system architecture, we determine whether we need to have a human in the loop or a human on the loop and automate those to close that gaps as we go through there. And lastly, we'd like to take all this and converge it uh, in align with the Chief of Staff's modernization priorities and, and get those uh, systems out with the next LRPF, the next generation ADA, next generation combat vehicle and FVL. So you can see why 28 becomes a very important time period for us. So that's uh, my pitch. I think I'm out of time. I defer to Colonel Handy for the remainder. Thanks to the AUSA leadership and to the panel leadership for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I look forward to the open dialogue. What I'd like to do is just offer up a couple of quick uh, brief comments. Now, although the threats and the nature of warfare continue to change over the past few decades, 
the basis of war fighting, I think we'll all can agree, remain the same. What continues to change are the complexities of the enabling mechanisms that we're using in order to pursue that war. Battles can now be fought with keyboards and electrons to some uh, devastating effects. We clearly see this in the advancements of both space, cyber, missile defense, and directed energy. If we use history as kind of a start point, as we often do, those old military theorists always espouse that we should be engaging an enemy at a time and a point that we decide. What we see is missile defense and space-based uh, assets allowing us to better do that and to more quickly do it. You know, the old motto of first to fire that many of us said as second lieutenants as we were walking around um, has more of a meaning today than I think that it ever has in the past. As we start seeing the effects of missile defense and space, we'll see that those are going to tip, uh, truly be some of the first systems to fire. During my time out at uh, ARCIC, well, the former ARCIC, I guess, um, General Dias and others um, started espousing this concept of pocket of opportunities by linear engagements. As we look to try to put a foothold on these pockets of opportunities, we again see where hypersonics, missile defense, and space-based assets are going to be the key to making sure that those multi-domain operations are going to actually be successful. As we look to try to engage left of lunch, the unlight of sight, how do we integrate fires at long distance? Again, the need for space-based assets becomes even more critical. Now, in order to ensure that our forces are remained um, the top notch that they are, there's a couple of responsibilities that we all can agree as leaders are necessary. That's to make sure that we're properly organized, manned, and equipped. Um, this is not a paid plug, but if the center of excellence out at SMDC and the stuff that they're doing with space training, if you're not familiar with it, I'd really appreciate it if you take a look at that some cutting edge stuff in order to ensure that our entire army as well as our joint forces are properly trained in what space-based assets can actually do. I'll leave the man piece to some of the other people to talk about on Space Force and the Space and Command the Organized piece. But as far as being equipped, um, new weapon systems and ways to combat these new threats, some of the basics remain the same but just needs to be transferred and we need to reinforce the focus that we've always had on them. Those include m &S, t and &E, Systems Engineering and Integration. These not only save money and time, but I think we can all agree they save lives in the long run. Reinventing our focus on that will pay long dividends in the, in the future. We often use the word cyber, and it needs to remain a focus, but I think we all can agree that it needs to be more than a noun. It has to be an action verb. We have to be able to secure these systems and the downlinks that are taking place, as we saw from the video that General Dickinson showed earlier. Our ability to do that also leads to our success. Now, as far as partnerships, to ensure we're going to remain overmatched and we're ready and prepared, there has to be a combination between government, academia, and industry going after these, um, working together to go after these targets and threats. Uh, coming off script just a little bit, I do remember um, back when I was in uniform when a contractor came to me and made the statement, I'm here to help. Uh, you always got that cringing feeling inside of you that what's coming next. Now that I'm actually on the other side of the table and I'm looking at the men and women every day that are out there waking up every morning to ensure that our soldiers, um, airmen and Marines, are properly trained and they're ready to go after that mission, I do feel, uh, truly believe that the industry, academia, and government partnership is something that is going to be critical for the U.S. to remain a nation where no other nation will ever um, attempt to even come after us. And with that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, panel. Um, you know, we were charged with talking about space support and global missile defense and widening our vision and just taking a few notes. We heard about space capabilities and proliferated LEO, IAMD, offense, defense integration, new technologies from hypersonics to DE to AI to microelectronics to cyber. We heard about conversion and interoperability and partnerships with our allies. I think we've the panel has widened our vision in this discussion on space and missile defense. Before I get several questions came in on this e-poll. Um, before I take the first one, though, I want to read one that came in, I think, General Carbler, while you were speaking, and it's not a question, so you're off the hook. But it's important. I think it's going to put everything we're talking about in context. And this was not written by my mom, God rest her soul, but it could have been. And it says, I don't have a question. But my son is currently in this program, and I would like to thank you for your time, and I really thank you that you support people first and being able to make decisions with them in mind. God bless. 
So here. So with that, our first question is analog, uh, and it's for Doctor, which which I'm which I'm much more capable of handling. Uh, it's for Dr. Lewis, yeah. uh, our panel chair. It says the space sensor layer was transferred to SDA in this year's budget. Could you confirm that the effort will remain focused on tracking both hypersonic and ballistic missile threats? If not, can you describe the challenges opened up and uh, if it were to track only hypersonic and not ballistic missiles? I can confirm it is both hypersonic and ballistic missiles. Yes. <laughs> okay. It says uh, there seems to be, Doc, this is again for yeah. you, All and right. then we'll, others can chime in. Uh, there seems to be multiple space capability development agencies and centers. Do you see a consolidation of these efforts to streamline and focus on critical areas? Well, it depends on what you mean by consolidation. So, yeah, there are multiple agencies. Obviously, we've got MDA, the relatively new SDA, and SCO. Each actually has a unique niche and a unique application. Um, what we do expect eventually, SDA will fall under the Space Force eventually. Um, so I guess in that sense there will be consolidation, but, but that will be part of the evolution of the Space Force. Okay. Uh, let me scroll through here. For uh, Colonel Josie. Um, can you talk about how you are working with the Air Force on the advanced battle management system, particularly with regard to integrating space-derived data into the common ground system? And I don't know if you might want to talk about that as well, but if you're working with the Air yeah, Force so on that. I do, I can say that, you know, across all of our signature efforts, we do make an, uh, a concerted effort to, of course, go joint, you know, the... AP&T effort. We work through the GINWIC. I work through conferences there. I know JADC2 is a concept that comes up and we talk. Uh, you know, right now, we're in the real, the nascent fa uh, stages of the sensor-to-shooter linkages and defining what we want to do. And I, I don't recall off the top of my head if we have any active uh, coordination with that particular program on, on our sensor-to-shooter operations. Okay. Did you have a comment on that? Sure. So so let me let me put on my, my, my third floor hat. Um, I think this is actually one of the areas that we see the best coordination between the services. Uh, the Army and the Air Force are aligned very closely in their thoughts on, on FNC cubed. Um, we've got a roadmap in r and &E. It looks very similar to the Air Force roadmap, and the Army has been a fantastic participant in developing that. Now, this one came in for Colonel Little, and it says, can you speak in more detail about using Army missile defense radars for SSA? How can that be done, and is there a roadmap or an expected IOC for that capability? So I, I think most everybody in the room here recognizes the, the Antipi Y2 radars as a, as a missile warning capability. But I would tell you is, is the MDA and Raytheon designed that radar to, to not only do missile warning, but to do space surveillance and data collection. So it's just a capability that resides within the radar that we have not really been exercising. Uh, so with, we, we talked about the adversary earlier, as they put more objects in space uh, we need more ability to to survey uh, what's up there. Uh, so I, I think the demand, based on what the adversary is doing, is, is pushing us to leverage this capability that really already exists within the radar. We just we just have to start exercising it. And then from the joint perspective, you know, we need to dial it back and make sure it can do it. Does it need to do it? And you know, we're assisting CENTCOM in doing that gap analysis to see. Uh, does that radar need to be a dual use system? You know, our gut tells us it does, and we believe it does, but analyzing that gap will give us some uh, tangible metrics to then get after the problem and mitigate uh, a potential gap. Okay, uh, the next question uh, for Colonel Roseberry. What is the Army staff view regarding service components for U.S. Space Command? Thanks, sir. I appreciate that. Um, obviously, first and foremost, uh, the Army recognizes it has a critical role in space, right? It has space capabilities and it has a huge dependence upon space. Uh, so as I kind of look back over the last year um, and all the processes for uh, Space Command's establishment, and, and as you recognize, it really was from a flash to bang uh, just over a little year. 
Um, I think the, the Army's biggest concern was how do we differentiate now two different combatant commands, one with a missile defense mission set and one with a space mission set, when we, we as an Army see the synergy between those missions so closely aligned. Um, so obviously as Space Command was established, we were full in support of establishing a service component command, but we didn't want to break those linkages between the, uh, those two very related uh, mission areas. So uh, in the FAST timeline, we participated in a bunch of joint staff-led TTXs on establishment to see whether a construct as it's currently laid out on, uh, for having SMDC um, providing those uh, combatant command or component command capabilities to both combatant commands was feasible and executable. And we learned through that process that, that it fundamentally it was, and it met both of our goals, having the dedication to both combatant commands to two dedicated missions, but yet having a synergy within the Army's component to keep those mission, missions aligned. Okay, great, thank you. That was a, a good answer. Um, Dr. Lewis, um, you discussed DOD's desire to acquire hypersonic weapons at scale. Can you expand how OSD will delineate those weapons by services and how to pay for them? Sure. Well, let me start out by saying hypersonics is not a single thing. It's a range of capabilities. Those capabilities have certain attributes, speed, maneuverability, the trajectories in which they operate. And we believe that there's a role for each of the services to play. And, and, and frankly, this, I think this is one of the best news stories that we have right now in the Pentagon, the, the, the uh, collaboration, the interaction of the services. Um, the Army and the Navy, for example, are working hand-in-hand -hand on, on conventional prompt strike solutions. Uh, Admiral Wolf, General Thurgood, General Thurgood leading the Army, Army efforts, Admiral Wolf on the Navy side, uh, interacting on a daily basis, sharing technology, sharing concepts, but which, each with their unique perspectives. Um, we're also working very closely with, with the Air Force. Um, as part of our strategy for, for scaling up, we're, we're looking to all, all the services. And our view is to take the prototypes that are being developed and to start thinking about how we deliver in the numbers that are commensurate with what, with what we see as our future needs. Um, uh, e some of those unique capabilities, for example, the Air Force is obviously we, we is focusing on air launch systems. We think that's uh, vital to being able to deliver the numbers of weapons that we that, that we envision. But obviously, there's there's also tremendous value in, in sea launched options and ground launched options. Um, in terms of how to pay for it, it's one of our biggest investment areas right now. Um, yesterday, Mike Griffin announced that we've got an acceleration plan. Uh, the exact numbers um, are under wraps, but suffice it to say, we believe we've got we've got the funding in place now to uh, uh, fund our activities at the level that we need. We we believe is 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 appropriate for for our needs. Okay, and thank you. This question came in, and I'll open up to all panel members. Uh, it's a particular interest of our industry partners. And it says, how will you use or partner with the commercial industry in, sp in space as the budget shrinks? What will the policy be with data dissemination and authorities? The commercial industry is now a big player in space, especially satellites. What about RF spectrum? So there's a couple of you that might want to take that on. We'll take the first swing at it, sir. Uh, Lieutenant General Carbler mentioned earlier uh, the sequence of developmental and operational testing and how possibly synchronizing those events, getting the Army requirements into the testing earlier with a better partnership uh, with industry uh, could potentially uh, drive down the costs as the budget gets smaller. I also think this goes back to my earlier comments about the uh, use of systems integrators, integration, testing, and engineering. If we can use those up front and make sure that they're fully integrated with what's going on with these systems as they're coming on board, again, it's big cost savings if we can actually take models, simulate things as they're going. Hypersonics test, as we know, is quite an expensive event. Being able to properly model that and test it in uh, the correct environment could save us dollars and actually also accelerate getting those programs out to the field. And I think, I think Pete Leo gives us a, an unprecedented um, you know, opportunity. Um, when you look at uh, the, the sheer numbers of satellites that go up and the reduced number of costs to do it, uh, you can, it gives us a, an array of opportunities of how to solve the problems, whether it's hosted payloads, building our own buses, doing those types of things, and what are the sensitivities of those payloads that need to be on there, right? And so I think that to just the fact that, you know, the commercial is putting 
up a, a large investment in this um, this arena, but we can certainly look at areas where we can leverage and invest in in the future. Okay, next question is uh, for Dr. Lewis. Um, uh, yeah, they like having an OSD guy. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned a space technology roadmap. Uh, will this document be made public? Uh, the unclassified parts will. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're, they're obviously going to be uh, classified parts of the roadmap, and those will be handled appropriately. Um, this question, and we don't really have a, a lead programmer on the panel, but we do have at least one in acquisition. I'm going to start with you, Colonel Josie, and see if you think you want to take this on. Uh, but it says, with a flattening budget, how do you keep space system funding at the forefront of Army funding with competition from NGCV, future vertical lift, and the other modernization priorities? Okay, first off, I am not an acquisition. I've never been an acquisition. I know, but you're, but you're, but you're I in, just but happen you're in to find my way to the AP&T office. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> we did notice those rifles on your car. Yeah, right, your lapel. So, so General Murray is, is, has been very adamant that we have to ensure that everything we do is, is provides the value to the soldier. When you look at what I talked about, the requirement, the capability, and the cost, you know, he, he defined that as the value, and that value is, is what the, that capability gives the soldier. We don't want to solve problems and come up with a solution that further complicates that problem we were trying to solve, and so that soldier feedback is critical. And so I, I think that that relates to the, the, the question that we asked there, is how do we keep this in the forefront? Well, we, we have to continuously... Um, emphasize what is, you know, what are the requirements of the MDO, what are the problems that we're trying to solve, and then demonstrate that the capabilities that we're bringing online in time um, uh, will matter uh, when, when, the, when the shooting starts. And I think that that's the way that that, uh, that cadence resonates uh, with both senior leaders and within Congress. Over. Okay, thanks. Um, this question, probably a couple of you on the panel, I'm going to just throw it out and see who wants to grab it. Um, how do you intend to harness and incorporate commercial organizations and international partners into the LEO proliferation initiative? Colonel Josie, you want to take a shot at that? Come on now, you got the AP and T CFT. That's great. So I would say that it, um, that that is. You're right, sir. You got me. That is one of the, the fundamental aspects of what, what the AFC and, and the CFTs do. We go out and we, we don't look at the traditional means, you know, through our labs to develop this. We are out with industry. We're out with academia. And, and um, you know, we, we establish those contacts and meetings. We, we do small business initiatives. What are some of the, you, if you may not be able to solve those big problems, how are you solving some of these little problems? And maybe we can introduce uh, those smaller companies to the larger companies and then solve those problems together. So I will say that, you know, we have looked at heavily the capability of, you know, commercial um, industry within the PLEO to, in their ability to launch, you know, in volume, uh, reduce the cost down and, and um, what are the, you know, what, you know, get the dimensions and what, what spaces are available within there as well as what are those capabilities that, they, that are already existent and then determine how to best bring those in and, and, and provide that, op, uh, that data uh, down to the soldier level. Okay, thanks. Um, I got another one for, uh, for you. It says, uh, I'm encouraged by your focus on our future operational concepts, especially regarding hypersonic weapons. However, I'm concerned that we may field weapons before the kill chain. I'm trying to follow this reading here. If LRHW hits the forces in fiscal year 22 and the kill chain in fiscal year 28, how do we align this, especially on the small sat LEO side and now with Titan? So I think we're trying to line up our ability to react to a, to a threat and whether we got the timing right at 2028, if uh, capabilities are going to be ready to, to defeat or attack us in 2022. I think if I've got that question right, and if I didn't get you right, please feel free to speak up. 
So I think I have part of this, but I also think my HQDA G357 has a part of this as well. You know, when it comes to, you know, from our perspective, Army Futures Command, when I defined what those horizons were for us, I looked at near as, as to 22, uh, mid is the palm, and then far is beyond that. They're actually lined up a little bit longer than that. Their near term goes through the palm, and then there's about five, seven years after that is their midterm, and they're actually looking 38 and beyond. So at the AFC headquarters, when you look at the, there's eight cross-functional teams, by the way, and they're all aligned with, with these delivering these new capabilities. So at the AFC headquarters level, there is um, effort being done to look at and aligning these across with both the funding lines, uh, determining what's in the realm of possibility with delivering those capabilities, and then we, we are in consistent and, and constant uh, coordination with both HQDA G357 on when these capabilities can be delivered and what are the gaps that we're trying to mitigate and what their priorities are, as well as the G8 and determine what is in the realm of possible within the budget that we're given uh, um, to move forward there. So, you know, the, the concerns are not necessarily addressed individually at the CFT level, but we do have a four-star headquarters in Austin that's charged and empowered with ensuring that these capabilities converge at the time and place where we're able to deliver it. And then we, of course, get our prioritization and direction from HQDA uh, 357 and 8. Okay, thanks. I'm going to direct the next question to Colonel Little. Um, we had an earlier question about the headquarters DA perspective on our Army space capabilities uh, as a space component to Space Command. Um, can you expound on, now that we have a Space Command and the developing Space Force, uh, how it is that the Army is uh, providing current space capabilities uh, to U.S. SpaceCom? Yes, sir. So, uh, already mentioned earlier, our commanding general, General Carbler, has kind of dual-hatted uh, between the service component to STRATCOM and I guess the not yet approved uh, service component hat to SpaceCom. Uh, so the, the operational side of, of SpaceCom that was briefed earlier is the CIFSIC. Uh, so right now Major General Shaw is the, uh, the commander of, of the CIFSIC. So I, uh, twice a week I am reporting to him the operational status of, of uh, all the space elements within my formation. So uh, we engage with, with SpaceCom and, and provide that operational support to them uh, on, on a daily basis. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this one's coming in from uh, the e-poll, and again, I think several of you may want to touch, touch it, but it says to all, if you could get one capability from industry right now, unconstrained, what would you want? What would it be? Besides free lunch. <laughs> Anybody? One capability, unconstrained, what would you want? Okay, I'll let you think about that one. <laughs> um, Colonel Little, what challenges do the elements of 1st Space Brigade have when rapidly integrating with deployed units? Resources, ability to connect the networks, what are your, what are your uh, specific challenges? So I, I would tell you, I think we do a, a, a pretty good job of integrating with Warfighter. Um, one of our, our core mission areas is, is uh, space support to the Warfighter, and we do that through exercises. Um, you know, what I talked about in my remarks were challenges with authorities and, and challenges with the C2 structure. That, that's probably the, the biggest challenge we have, and that's just not Army. That's, that's uh, across the board with, with the joint force. And, and again, I think that's tied to the fact that we, we could afford to move slow against the adversary we've been against the last 19 years. Uh, a near peer, we've got to work through the challenges uh, with authorities and with the, with the C2 structure. So that, that's probably... Uh, the biggest challenge that I would identify. But, but across the board, I think we do a pretty good job of bridging the gap uh, between the technical side of space and the practical application of those effects to the warfighter. Uh, the next question, the next two actually are about proliferated LEO, which uh, has been a high topic of uh, interest for this panel. And first for the Army reps, it says, is there a roadmap for how the Army will develop its own proliferated LEO constellation and how you are integrating with the Space Development Agency as they develop their architecture. And there may be a question inside that question, the way it was worded. So, Colonel Josie, that goes to you first. Yeah, and so you know, the, the pace of space is not really as, as quick as some of these other things that can come out. And so we're, we're currently in the, the evaluation stage of, of developing what those 
what is the, the, the capabilities, what are our requirements that we need as an army, as a service, and determine how Leo can best do it? Is there a, a plan for a, a army specific Leo structure? No. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a lot of thought has been put into what are the capabilities that are available now, what do we need to to fight our future um, for MDO, and then what do we need? What's relevant to distill it down to the warfighter? In what density? In what capacity? And in which what pipelines that need to, these need to flow through? So yeah, I don't want to like throw the answer off and say, hey, you know, because someone's going to ask me for that roadmap. I know because they just asked for that. There is a lot of thought put into it. Is there a codified roadmap? No. Do we have an idea of what the capabilities that we need? We want to proliferate out, uh, and but we got to do a lot of experimentation. We got to do some demonstration, and we got to balance that on um, you know how the future unfolds. Thanks. And a related question to Dr. Lewis. Can you expand on OSD's focus on LEO proliferation and how it's intended to protect, protect GEOINT operations? Sure. So I guess I'll, I'll explain it with a quote from the, our, our vice chairman, uh, General Hyten, who said that, that right now many of our space assets are not only targets, they're juicy targets. He, he, his, his term. Uh, because they're exquisite, they have exquisite capabilities. They're very expensive, and and frankly, they've got vulnerabilities. So, so our view on proliferated Leo is is is, is really pretty straightforward. Um, the the smaller you, the lower your altitude, the smaller your satellite can be. It's the the tyranny of aperture. I go to a lower altitude, I can have a smaller aperture, lower power requirements. I can do things with a smaller satellite. That means I can build more of them. They're faster moving. Um, we think that means that they're harder to take out. Certainly, more is better from the standpoint of confounding a potential adversary. Um, so that's our focus. Um, there are some things that a small satellite will never replace, and some capabilities that a small satellite will never be able to replicate in, in, you know, compared to a big satellite. But we think there are some important things that a small satellite can do that supplements our capabilities and makes us more resilient. So th hence, our, hence our, big, our, our big push in that direction. Okay, thanks. Um, we're uh, about out of time. I'm going to start with Colonel Handy down there at the at the end. Come down. You get about 30 seconds to give us uh, closing comments. I appreciate it once again the opportunity to come and uh, speak with individuals today. As you can see, we've got a bright future forward as it pertains to a hypersonics, missile defense, and directed energy. And we look forward to continuing the dialogue to make sure that that happens for our forces. Thanks. I just say when I appreciate the uh, the questions and the comments that were coming up through there, I understand that uh, this is a a, uh, you know, a brave new world that we're moving into, and, and it's an area that uh, you know the Army is looking at where it can can manage merge those capabilities with the with where the space can deliver for us. So thank you again. Yeah, just a, a final takeaway is just the, the the criticality of a space sensor layer uh, for missile defense. It's a key application. Uh, especially as we look at uh, threats such as the hypersonics. And I appreciate everyone's comments and questions and uh, look forward to continuing the discussion further. Thank you. So I think I, I brought kind of the operational perspective uh, of space in support of the warfighter. A uh, key takeaway that I, I would really like to impress upon everyone here is, is bringing it back to fires and maneuver. Uh, the, the way the Army fights and wins is, is uh, through supporting fires. And we need to treat effects from space and, and non-lethal effects uh, no different than, than uh, the other fires that, that we've grown accustomed to using. Thank you. Again, just like to thank everyone here at ASA today. Uh, exciting times in the space community. Uh, certainly a lot of the discussion today about future capabilities, um, really responding to space as a warfight and domain, and really focused on providing us those resilient architectures going forward with the capacity and the persistence necessary in our future operations. Okay. Okay. So let me, let me close with the observation that the United States military uses space more effectively and more thoroughly than any, anyone else. Uh, that's one of our great strengths, but it also introduces vulnerabilities. And the world has, uh, folks in the world have figured that out. So it's a, it, it is an ongoing research priority for us. It's a primary modernization priority for us and will continue to be so. Okay, so let me uh, close this out by first uh, thanking the panel uh, for your uh, thoughtful preparation and for your remarks and answers to the questions. Dr. Lewis, thank you for joining us and for the uh, expertise that you brought to the panel. 
Uh, I'd like to thank the audience, those here and those in the 63 distant stations, for your attention and for your in insightful uh, questions. Um, I think you really helped us get after the topic of uh, space, sport, and global missile defense and widening our vision. And, of course, I always thank again AUSA for what you do for our soldiers, our families, and for the Army. And as I often do when I close the opportunity to moderate a panel, um, much of the focus uh, in our discussions and in the questions that you provided always seem to revolve around technology. And like that, Mom's e-comment reminds us, and this panel helps us remember that the most critical space and integrated air and missile defense capabilities that our nation has are the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and civilians who develop, deploy, and operate those systems, and we thank them for their service. Thank you all very much. You're here.